Lake City, Utah, 1985. Two people associated with a failing investment firm, $4.5 million in the red, are killed within minutes of each other on opposite ends of town by homemade bombs. Police zero in on a clue. Both devices use the same trigger mechanism, a mercury switch. Mercury just kind of ebbs and flows, and the idea is when mercury moves one direction or another, it's going to make this electric contact. When a bomb with this type of mechanism is tilted, the electric circuit is completed by the mercury. The current ignites the powder and detonates the bomb. The police begin searching for disgruntled investors in Christensen and Sheets' failing business. But the architect behind the murders is an unassuming document dealer who's not even on their radar, Mark Hoffman. Mark Hoffman's brilliance was in the fact that nobody really saw him coming. He was this nerdy little guy who talked in a very professorial way. Everybody trusted Mark Hoffman. In the 1980s, Mark Hoffman is widely considered the most prolific historical document dealer in the country. But his business and reputation is all a sham. A skilled con artist, Hoffman creates counterfeits by forging the signatures of over 80 different prominent figures in American history. This is a list written by Hoffman himself of some of the people who we forged. John Adams, John Quincy Adams, Billy the Kid, Daniel Boone, Emily Dickinson, John Hancock, Andrew Johnson, Betsy Ross, Miles Standish, Mark Twain, George Washington. Hoffman is so good that over a five-year period, he peddles over a million dollars worth of fakes. A forger has to practice until he's perfect. You have to practice so many times that you can let it flow. But handwriting is just one part of Hoffman's forgery game. Any artist can pretty accurately duplicate the lines on a paper. But when it comes to the actual paper itself, those are things that are much more complicated. Finding centuries-old paper is no easy task, so Hoffman develops his own method of turning new into old. He developed a lot of his own techniques, putting it in an oven, baking it, uh, rubbing dirt on it. If you heat something long enough, it curls the paper, just as if it was aged naturally. But the final touch to the perfect forgery is using the right ink. Back in the 1800s, they made their own ink. The ink recipes are available, and that's what Mark Hoffman did. He found an ink recipe, he went and found the root components of that recipe, and he made his own ink. While Hoffman pulls off the perfect ruse with ease, there's more to this con artist than meets the eye. He also has a darker side that stems from his deep-rooted hatred of the Mormon church. Mark Hoffman was a non-believing Mormon. It's my belief that Hoffman somehow felt belittled by the church at some point in his upbringing, and I think he wanted to punish them. With its headquarters based in his hometown of Salt Lake City, Hoffman devises a plan to go after the church for money. Hoffman knew that the church is almost entirely based on found documents, so he knew that they would be very interested in finding new ones. In 1984, Hoffman presents the church with an old letter that adds a shocking new detail to the legend behind the Book of Mormon. According to Mormon history, founder Joseph Smith was visited by the angel Moroni who directed him to a box that was buried by a tree near his house. In this box were some gilded plates that Joseph Smith, in turn, it's told, translated into the Book of Mormon. Well, Mark Hoffman decides to turn that tale sideways. He forged some documents, things like a letter claiming that Joseph Smith hadn't actually been visited by an angel, but in fact, it was a salamander. I mean, here he was saying that the original story between Joseph Smith and the angel was a falsehood. Hoffman tells the church that he will keep the contents of the letter a secret and offers to sell it to them so they can keep it under wraps. What Hoffman was doing was offering a ransom. I'll sell this to you and you could keep it quiet. I'm not going to publicize it. 
Mormon officials take the bait as Hoffman sells the letter for $40,000 to church elder Steve Christensen. But Hoffman reneges on the deal, releasing the contents of the manuscript to the media. The infamous Salamander letter calls into question the very origins of the Mormon religion. It's a huge embarrassment to the church, and the devious Hoffman denies being the source of the leak. He was able to create forged documents that were questioning the basic tenets of the religion, therefore basically extort money from the church. By 1985, despite making more than $1 million over five years selling his forged documents, Hoffman finds himself desperate for money. So he goes back to church elder Steve Christensen and once again blackmails him claiming he's just found a new batch of documents that might publicly embarrass the church if they wound up in the wrong hands. Hoffman strong arms Christensen into giving him a six-figure advance to purchase the documents. He was greedy and wanted money. He had ego, and every time he was able to foist one of his forgeries, that ego was fed. And then he ran into a problem. Christensen demands delivery of the documents for the Mormon church, but they don't exist, and it will take Hoffman months to forge them. He needed to buy time. What could he do? Under intense pressure, the master forger snaps. In Hoffman's eyes, he's only got one choice, murder. And his target is Mormon elder Steve Christensen. Out of desperation, he resorted to bombing, which is a huge step up from forgery. Hoffman builds a pipe bomb filled with black gunpowder and arms the device with a mercury switch. He used a lot of his knowledge of high school chemistry and what he had learned in various science courses and probably did some research. Then he was able to figure it out from local Radio Shack parts. On the morning of October 15, 1985, Mark Hoffman delivers his fateful package. Coming up, the bombs that rock Salt Lake City. He makes a decision to kill people that can ruin his game. That's evil. 